Today, does burnout economics equal stagflation? Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one that is post covering finance and property news. I'm joined again by Tarek. Hi, Tarek. How are you going? Yeah, not too bad, mate. How are you? <laughs> Pretty good. Boy, 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 we are in deep water now. I've got this vision of uh, central bankers at the end of the Titanic as it sort of slides gently into the, into the sea and uh, looking a bit confused. Well, I think we could that, that that's quite a nice analogy because we can sort of imagine Powell back in December when he was sort of very much doing his mission accomplished victory lap like George Bush on that aircraft carrier uh, during the Iraq war, you know, just saying, oh, you know, we've 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 done our job, you know, rate cuts are coming up. And I think the thing is, is when the when the Titanic snapped in half, everyone on on the part that was, you know, up in the air was thinking, well, this is actually pretty good. You know, this is actually going relatively, relatively well. But then it starts to sink and then everything just sort of gets a little bit cold and miserable. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. And uh, I would say that there are a few other central bankers from other central banks around the place who would be joining him, right? Um, <laughs> thinking, hey, my toes are getting a bit wet. It's an interesting one because the thing is where the Fed leads, the rest of the world is forced to follow. I mean, we're seeing that a little bit today with the, the Bank of Japan basically, you know, releasing a nothing burger in terms of a, a, its statement, basically just a com relative, relatively speaking, a commitment to the status quo and the market not liking that and it, the Japanese currency continuing to fall. And I mean, even if you look at, say, for example, the, into the developing world in Indonesia, where they've, where they've seen currency pressures like, well, pretty much the, most of the rest of the world against the US dollar, they're raising rates because they have the scope to do so. And the question is, will that, will that, spread into the developed world and will you know central bankers be forced into that catch-22 of you can either you know deal with the stagflation you know or you can raise rates you know it's it's not a, not, a, not a nice situation if if that is the scenario that comes to pass well i think it's interesting in the us that the markets were betting on six rate cuts this year it's now down to one if you keep your fingers crossed Right. Yeah. And of course, in Australia, I just saw Christopher Joy's recent article, but he was saying, well, you know, rates could well be going up. And Warren Hogan's talking about 5.1% as the cash rate target potentially. So um, the world is changing quite fast. And the consequences of this are quite profound, which takes us right back to the burnout economics, which, of course, you've been speaking about for some time, which is effectively you've got central bankers trying to pull the brake whilst um, government is uh, throwing stimulus. Of course, we've got, what, 20 billion of stimulus coming through tax cuts um, uh, next f financial year. We've got a budget ahead. And Chalmers, of course, um, after the inflation numbers this time around, saying, well, the numbers don't look too bad because it's still lower than where it was a year ago, without actually really recognising that, of course, the base effects are actually helping, but, but not really. I very much miss opposition leader Chalmers because... I, I genuinely respected the way that he looked at things in terms of like he looked at per capita GDP, he looked at real wages, he looked at real outcomes, he looked at the, you know, the broader underlying themes going on in a data release rather than just headline says this. And that's something that he criticised, you know, Josh Frydenberg for and Scott Morrison for on a relatively regular basis. And he was absolutely right. The thing is, he's doing the exact same thing now that 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 Morrison and Frydenberg used to do. And I think the thing is, is, and we'll get to this later in the show in the charts, but when you look at the breakdown of inflation for Australia, it's really not all that impressive. Like 3.6% sounds pretty good, but when you realise how we've arrived at that particular juncture, all of a sudden you start to think, well, it's going to get a whole lot harder from here to get, you know, to, to get the next, you know, one, you know, 1% 1 or 1.6% worth of inflation down. Well, and as I said, with the extra stimulus that's coming through from that ta those tax cuts and the other little uh, tweaks and things that are going on at the moment. And remember, of course, the inflation is artificially suppressed because of the uh, government support for energy, for example, You know, because the numbers were actually a long, long way down from where it would have been if they hadn't been supporting that. And the question is, will they continue that next year? Because at some, ta at some stage, they're going to have to withdraw that. And when they do, inflation 
bounces up. Rents, of course, continuing to uh, be, be extremely strong as well. Uh, so, you know, you, when you look at it closely, uh, the, the puzzle is is quite difficult and complex to unpick. But um, I'm afraid that uh, the political spin of everything's fine, folks, and, you know, we're going to give some more support to um, households um, doesn't cut the mustard at all. No, and you make an important point. If we strip out the impact of the electricity subsidies and we strip out the impact of the inc- of the increases to rental subsidies as well, then all of a sudden we'd be looking at more like just about 4% inflation in headline terms. And part of the problem going forward is that we're not we're not deleting, we're not completely mitigating the impact of rising electricity prices. We're just kicking the can down the road again and again and again and again. And eventually it is going to feed into the CPI. It's just a question of when that ends up happening. And the problem is, is if Albo does extend the electricity subsidies, as some reports suggest that he will for another year, all the way until after the next election, <laughs> that that will in effect suppress the CPI by about 0.2 to 0.3% in headline terms compared with where it otherwise would be. And that's a fairly significant sort of, you know, sort of difference. If all of a sudden it's the difference between 2.9 and 3.2, then that's something that's, you know, that, that could really tilt things in one direction or another. And well, but eventually we're going to have to pay for that. You know whether it's whether Albo chooses to just take 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 the hit now, or whether he chooses to take it after the election. Guess which one he'll choose. Post the election, but of course the other factor in all of this is the rental growth, which is stoked by very high migration, and uh, the chances of them dialing back migration anytime soon is uh, close to zero in my view. So the rental numbers will still stay strong, and that's going to also feed inflation. So you know the the inflation monster ain't dead. And just before we get into your slides, let me just to highlight the, the US data that came out overnight Thursday included, of course, um, a weak GDP, um, significantly weaker than people expected, but also the first version of the PCE. Now, this isn't the PCE that the Fed will go with, which comes out later on. But nevertheless, it shows that you've got stagflation in a time of weak growth, weaker growth than expected with stronger than expected inflation, which is the worst of all worlds. It is. And I think it's really something that they achieved 1.6% annualized growth in Q1 with a deficit north of 8%. That that's gotta be that's gotta be some sort of record for for failure outside of, you know, just outside of COVID, really. Because I I I I can't think of another scenario in which outside of at least the depression when they had such a large deficit but achieved such a poor result. It's 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 really rather impressive in some ways in a neg- in, well in a negative way. <laughs> well, yes, you have to uh, you know manipulate the figures in a particular way to make that happen. Of course, there's two other factors that the high imports was actually one significant factor, and some people are stripping that out and saying, well, that's why it's low. And of course, the changes in inventory in the US are also a, a bit different from normal. So uh, a few people are saying, oh, this is an artificially suppressed number, and therefore, you know, the, the true number is different. <laughs> but the number is the number, isn't it? So there are market expectations now which have changed on the back of it. And uh, interestingly, of course, the the yields knock in on 5%. Uh, which is higher than it's been for some time, and um, those yields will feed through into, you know, significantly higher costs for all sorts of things. So uh, th- th- we are in a really, really fascinating um, part of the cycle. And anybody who thinks that the inflation dragon is uh, fallen over is, uh, I think, well, badly mistaken. Yeah, I think that the thing with inflation is that we saw a scenario where everything was very much priced to perfection. Where that there was, you know, this immaculate disinflation, uh, that inflation was going to come down without, you know, any sort of serious, you know, we'll not call it serious, we'll call it major economic repercussions, and obviously that hasn't that hasn't really happened. And you know, in the places where things have been paired back a little bit more, places say like for example in Germany, which is running a much tighter fiscal policy than in the US, well they've got a recession, so. It's really a, a, a catch twenty two situation of there are no good options. It's pick your poison. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. So there, there is no immaculate line of, of you know, being able to keep both the, the, the issues away and, and steer through. Interestingly, in, in, in the UK, believe it or not, the UK stock market has now reached a new peak. And um, everyone's now saying, well, maybe the worst of it's over here and maybe that it'll be the Bank of England that cuts rates first. Uh, but uh, we, we will see about that. I still think there's more water to go under the bridge there and uh, still a lot of market uh, speculation and market expectations. But, but the interesting observation for me is that with this um, higher for longer narrative now very much entrenched and with the higher yield costs, this is going to put big pressure on stock prices because, of course, the future discounts of uh, revenue will now be discounted at a higher rate, which means that the other, other valuations are huge. And it's interesting, Tesla's, I think, what, P at 59 uh, at the moment. Um, you know, some of the other uh, Magnificent Seven are in the P's around the 30. Um, I, th I think um, Meta is around 22, 21. So you can see there's quite a big range, but they're still you know, over-egged in terms of valuation. So that says to me that the downside risks on the stock markets now are pretty strong too. Well, one of the interesting ones for me is that if we do see yields continue to remain strong we still, we and we see growth hold up well enough on the, you know, just and we're amidst a backdrop of just higher than expected inflation, I think that creates a really interesting scenario in which all of a sudden a big hit to stock prices may actually be desirable for governments. Now, I realize that may sound, well, extremely counterintuitive, but at the end of the day, if it if it smashes down yields and it sends, you know, long yields back down to two to three percent and short yields, you know, potentially even further, at least in terms of an e a short term economic shock, all of a sudden servicing the debt, you know, you could in, in relative terms could halve compared with what it would be. And all of a sudden, that might seem like a relatively desirable option. Probably not right before an election, but afterwards, yeah. you know, then all of a sudden it starts looking like a real, you know, something that maybe, you know, doesn't look too bad. Well, I think you've got to make a very important point there because, of course, the markets up till very recently had sort of factored back in the Fed put, right? So the idea that if, in fact, markets were to drop, then the Fed would cut rates because um, they didn't want uh, the markets to, to go backwards. I think that narrative now needs to be questioned. I think that because of the high inflation and everything else that we're seeing, they might actually welcome uh, the reduction in prices in the stock markets because that basically is a tightening factor and they need a tightening factor. Uh, otherwise, they're going to have to put rates up even higher. I think that that's a really interesting sort of observation, just in the sense that, especially here in Australia, that we have all these options to tighten policy. We have all these different options to drive down inflation, but they're not being taken. It's being left pretty much solely in the hands of the RBA. Well, it is being left in the hands of the RBA, let's be honest. And it's getting to the point now where I feel like, and we'll, we'll get to this in, 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 in the charts in a few minutes, but I feel like we're getting to a point now where demand may potentially run away from the RBA to the point where we do potentially see that, you know, stagflationary scenario where, where whereby at a per capita level, and particularly for households with mortgages and households who are renting, so, well, most people, they're, they're getting, you know, rel in relative terms crushed while other parts of the economy are still doing, you know, relatively well on the back of you know, whether it's government spending or just increased aggregate demand through population growth. Absolutely. Makes a really, really interesting set of uh, observations. And I think that is a great segue into the charts. So let, let's go there, shall we? No worries. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the charts are, as always, available at avidcom.substack.com. And we shall get right into it. Now... I got curious recently about the impact of population growth relative to the RBA raising rates. So what I've done here is charted the impact of the increase in population growth since the RBA started raising rates until the, la the, la the latest possible data that I have for each of the two data sets. One of them is, the, is from the RBA, which is up to December. The other one is from the ABS, which is the labor force data, which is up to, I believe, March. 
Now, what this basically shows is that for most of the last 18 months, the increase in household consumption driven by working age population growth has been roughly on track with the amount of money that the RBA had been taking out of the economy by, by raising rates and raising the amount of scheduled mortgage repayments. The thing that's interesting to me in this is that this is based on a very crude level analysis in the sense that it's just based on a level of per capita spending divided by the number of working age people, because generally speaking, the level of consumption for people under the age of 15 is more or less non-existent. Their parents do the consuming for them. But I think that this just shows that they've been pretty much balanced out against each other. But now that the RBA has stopped raising rates, this is going to accelerate away further. So we're going to see a gap open between the two, which is going to potentially put a bit more upward pressure on inflation, which is just a, just a little interesting tidbit. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, the other observation is, of course, that uh, some households will be able to spend more and consume more because they've still got savings buffers and they don't have mortgages or rents to pay. Other households, not so much. So the distributional aspects of, of this isn't actually necessarily reflected in this particular chart, but I actually think the distributional aspect is pretty critical because, you know, in my surveys, I'm seeing more and more households who are more and more underwater in terms of cash flow. But we also know that there are still other households that are doing actually quite well and they've had the pay rises and uh, they've had uh, returns on their, um, their savings and investments uh, still supporting them. So the distortionary effect in terms of the overall economy at a household level, I think is pretty profound. It is. And I think that that's, I think that, you know, that sort of alludes, you know, was, that was something that we alluded to a little bit earlier, just in the sense that there is that divergence going on. And part of the problem with pursuing, you know, the burnout economics approach, whether it's using fiscal policy like the, the Biden administration to inject further cash into the economy, or whether it's the Albanese government's approach or the Trudeau government in Canada, whether it's their approach of using and increasing the population in order to keep up. The, the keep up headline GDP and keep up economic activity more broadly. That basically means that it keeps all the plates spinning. And while you do manage to avoid a recession, so yay for that, it ends up shrinking other people's, shrinking the per capita slice of the pie. And I think if you want, as you said, if you get into those distributional issues, I would say that the slice of the pie going to the median person is probably shrinking significantly more than the per capita figure would suggest. So that's that I think is something that's quite concerning because if we do if if for example we do continue to see inflation remain strong, you know, stronger than expected. Now while that's not something that I the that, that I that I personally foresee but it doesn't really matter. What if what if I'm wrong? What if the consensus is wrong? We could see a scenario whereby the continued growth in aggregate demand particularly once we once we start seeing the tax cuts and whatever whatever other goodies the government comes up with with the budget flow into the system we could see a scenario where rates either have to stay high or as Warren Hogan and even capital economics who reckons it's going to happen next month personally I don't see it but you know they're talking about you know rate cuts and relative sorry rate rises and relatively soon if that happens, you're going to be crushing that proportion of the population who is impacted, but you're still going to be running aggregate demand to the point where the rest of the economy could be growing and even be growing to the point of it being inflationary. So it's a complete mess, really. Well, let me be cynical for a minute. I mean, I'm not usually cynical, of course, but um, <laughs> the Labor government needs 51% of the votes to get re-elected. So somewhere there's a bit of a calculation going on as to which households are actually being adversely impacted, which households will vote for Labour. And what they will try and do is to put together a package of support, particularly in this budget, but maybe another one later in the year too, to make sure that they can demonstrate to 51% of the population that Labour's good for them. That's what they're looking for. That's all they're looking for at the moment. Um, it's a political stunt more than anything else. Uh, never mind the long-term implications and never mind the, um, the, the, you know, the broader um, issues with regard to inflation overall. As long as more than half of the population vote for Labour at the next time, then they feel they'll have won the argument. But in the process, they're wrecking a lot of things. Yeah.
rather than getting bogged down in the politics, I'm just going to get onto the next slide because we've got quite a few to get through today. <laughs> Go for it. Okay. Now, this is a chart of from the ABS of what inflation looks like in terms of the, the headline rate and the trimmed mean. So you look at it and you go, well, that doesn't look too bad. I will say that take it with a bit of a pinch of salt because one of the reasons why we saw such a huge blowout in the headline CPI is holiday travel costs in, in, that, in that last quarter of December uh, 2022. And if you strip those out of the equation, and the, RB, and, and the ABS has admitted that there are some serious issues with that, and that's why they're part of the volatile item section of the monthly CPI now, that that is one of the problems that they have encountered. Now, if we look at the CPI by category, you can see that on a quarterly basis, there are actually four categories that are in outright deflation. Communications, recreation and culture, which is driven by falling holiday travel costs, furnishing and household equipments and services, and clothing and footwear. So I think that that makes a very important point that we have already seen outright deflation in multiple categories of the CPI. And that is how we have arrived at that 3.6% year-on-year headline number. Now, the thing I say to people is, is are we going to see further levels of deflation to that magnitude again to help us dip down the next rung of the ladder? And short of some major economic shock, it's unlikely that those categories are going to fall this to the same degree that they already have. They're not going to be negative 4% without some sort of, you know, the wheels have come off sort of situation. So I think that that illustrates nicely just how challenging it, it it will be to you know get to get over that extra that extra mile and you know and then you look at what what's actually contributing to inflation these days it's it's the stuff that you need it's healthcare it's it's education it's insurance it's all it, it's housing it's all those things that you that you really need where and not only that I'm, i think it's also just worth noting that furnishings household and equipment services that is very much driven by household appliances and household furnishings being deeply deflationary. On a more normal, even keel, that would be slightly inflationary. So if we do start to see things return to that more even keel, then that's upward pressure on inflation, not downward. You know, a couple of observations. Firstly, if you look at it from a discretionary and non-discretionary element, actually the non-discretionary elements from an inflation inspector respect inflation perspective are down, but the non-discretionary ones continue to be a lot stronger. So in other words, the things you have to buy are actually inflating more significantly. The other interesting observation, um, if you look at particularly the um, audiovisual goods and those sorts of things, um, prices of those are roughly where they were. They haven't moved moved that much. But if you look at the analogs in like the US, or other areas, they've dropped significantly, somewhere between 17 and 25%, depending on where you look at the data point. So there is potentially some gouging going on in that particular sector of the economy in Australia. And once again, you know, you saw it with some of the supermarket data. Well, I suspect that the, um, the computer and audiovisual element is also where a lot of people are recovering a lot of margin. So that's another reason why, you know, these inflationary numbers are a bit wobbly. And of course, the other factor is they did some further reweightings. And guess what? They did more reweightings towards the travel and those sorts of things and away from building and construction and a few other bits and pieces as well. So you sort of sit there and think, well, hang on a moment. Some of these reweightings are also, you know, pulling the numbers in funny directions despite that. Despite that, the yeah. inflation number is still very strong. Well, I think the thing is, you know, even if you look at, say, like a category, say, like recreation and culture, if you look at, you know, say, some of the components of that, if you think about, say, for example, like a trip to the footy, if you think about a trip to the movies, when was the last time you, you saw deflation in either of those things? You know, or, you know, when was the last time, you know, your, you know, your hairdresser got cheaper or your vet or whoever? You know, like those services are not getting cheaper. <laughs> and, you know, eventually the downward pressure that we're seeing from these 
you know, temporary base effects are going to fade. And that is going to put a bit more upward, not a huge amount, but it doesn't need to be a huge amount. I think that's that's really the sort of key theme in all of this. It doesn't need to be like, you know, six, seven, eight percent. If it's if it's hovering around sort of, you know, 3.2, 3.5, that's still too high. Now, whether or not the RBA will cut under those circumstances, if if things start to go wrong in the labor market, well, that's another matter. Well, but the um, unemployment rate was, um, you know, rather surprisingly lower than many people expected and uh, below what the RBA was forecasting. They will publish some new forecasts in May when they do their next um, release, and it'll be quite interesting to see whether they revise anything or whether they, they you know, the keyword as was. And I saw some commentators saying, you know, what's all the fuss about? It's still pretty close to, uh, to what the RBA was saying. But it is the mix. It's the mix of inflation and the reasons why inflation has come down which is so critical, right? Because they will not be repeatable. And so there are other yeah. categories that are continuing to go the wrong way. And I guess if we go to the next slide, you can then look at the tradables and the non-tradables because that's another way of looking at the problem. Yeah, exactly. No, because what we've got here on the left is tradables, which is basically imported goods and services. Now, how can you import a service? Apparently you can. If you go on holiday overseas, that's importing a service because reasons. On the right there, we've got non-tradable. So that's things that are consumed and made domestically. So I think that really just illustrates quite nicely that inflation on that count, especially if you look at the little quarter on quarter but, um, bars on the graph on the right, it just shows that it bottomed out quite a while ago. So I think that we've got this sort of situation where there's very much two fights against inflation going on. In one, it's going very, very well. And in another, it's not going so well. Yeah, well, I would argue that the tradables is all about the um, healing of supply chains, which, of course, were significantly disrupted um, through COVID and post-COVID. And they've sort of got back to a more even keel now. But the non-tradables is homegrown inflation predominantly, and that's um, wages growth. That's the, where you see the very significant rise in insurance costs, for example, and um, you know some other factors too. They're the ones that are homegrown, but they're the ones that are out of control. And um, just to reiterate, you know, the, the tradables adjustments, which were supply chains healing, well, they've now healed, so you wouldn't necessarily expect to see further significant drops in the tradables ahead and the little bars begin to sort of show that there's been a turn. If that continues, then the net net of inflation overall is going to be pretty painful, which then takes us right back to, so will the RBA need to raise rates rather than hold rates or even cut rates? It's interesting because today the PPI came out, which is the producer price index, and that came in hotter than expected. You know, So we're starting to see a bit of a resurgence in producer prices. And that's something that I think is quite, quite, quite concerning because, you know, at least, you know, if you look, say, for example, in China, places like that, you know, the sort of manufacturing hubs, things are still relatively, you know, deflationary in that regard, but not on the domestic front, which is a bit concerning. And not only that, but we've seen some rises recently in commodity prices, which could really begin to complicate things once more. So it's a, it's a very challenging set of circumstances. And I think that that that's something that you and I have been talking about now for a while, just in the sense that it's not so much that there's like this big, huge thing that's going to keep inflation high. It's a lot of little things. And it's also the fact that the, the deflation or the disinflation story, the deflation story or the whatever you want to call it, it's predicated on a relatively narrow set of circumstances continuing. And I don't know if you've all noticed, but we've got a few wars on and some quite, in, you know, s some rather, you know, serious geopolitical, you know, shockwaves. So, you know, expecting that things are all just going to be, you know, maintained as, you know, sort of like late nineties, immaculate disinflation, then it's quite, it's you know, quite a little bit more challenging than that. Yeah. And some of the international agencies like the IMF have been talking about some of these risks and, you know, these elevated risks and how they could uh, propagate through and uh, oil prices, of course, have tended to be higher rather than, than lower and could go higher ahead. 
Um, the gas price shot all over the place um, in Europe quite recently because of what was going on with regard to um, the uh, gas stores in uh, Eastern Europe and also uh, some of the other issues there with regard to supply. So um, lots of uncertainties and uh, uncertainties in the context of higher inflation for longer. And I just want to come right back to your um, you know, fundamental thesis here about the burnout story, which basically is you've got fiscal and monetary pulling in two different directions, and that elastic is getting tighter and tighter and tighter, right? Something's got to go ping at some point. Yeah, exactly. It's either that or, you know, something breaks on the car and then all of a sudden you've got a recession, which is, you know, well and truly possible. <laughs> exactly. All righty. Now, this is, a, this is a chart from PropTrack on the costs of a new home, of home, of in particular, new home construction. Now, if you look there at, on the left, you can see the output costs for both houses and other residential, which is townhouses, apartments, units, etc. And you notice that they're both, they're both experiencing an uncomfortable bounce. And I think it's worth noting that that isn't something that has happened during these previous large drawdowns in demand. This is something different. And this all this is also reflected in the ABS numbers for new home costs, new home construction costs, which have been bouncing around now for the last three quarters between five and five point three percent. And if they do if they do sort of get stuck range bound in that in that rough sort of area, that's gonna make it a lot harder to kill inflation. You know, when you've potentially got rents and housing and say let's let's throw in council rates and ha and home maintenance accounting for like 1 1 1.2 1 1.4% of the headline cpi by themselves and i'm talking about percentage points not percent of the total so that leaves 0.6% at the bottom you know to keep it between two to to keep it uh, around 2%. So there's not really a whole lot of room for error in that regard. And I think that that is really the main theme in all of this is that it just doesn't take much to tip it in that wrong direction. Yeah, my analogy would be, you know, you've got this um, very narrow path with, um, you know, sheer drops on, on either side. But unfortunately, the width of the path is getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And it doesn't take much to be able to slide down one side or the other side. And uh, at the moment, um, you know, if you look ahead, it looks to me as though the, the path is, is pretty much disappearing in the distance, but getting so narrow that it's very unlikely to be able to traverse it for much longer. It's going to it's going it's to be interesting, I think, because there's, there's, they've just got we've got these very different competing narratives coming from government, coming from the market, coming from analysts, etc. And I think the thing is, you know, that like there was it was still a lot of hope. That we, we that we were going to see this immaculate disinflation that you know things that we're just going to work out you know nice and easy and I think it's really starting to sort of come home that maybe we won't and I think the thing is that when you and I talk about these things it's not like we talk about the sort of consensus as if it's impossible because it's not it's mm -hmm. you know nothing is ever impossible but I think that the part of the problem with the consensus in recent times is that it just hasn't had that room, that margin for error. You know, that that something might happen somewhere in the world or that maybe they just might get something wrong a little bit. It doesn't, and, and I mean, I think that's the one of the big things as well. Like, you know, say for example, like the US core PC, uh, core CPI and super core CPI, um, the most recent print, that wasn't off by a huge amount, but a couple of percentage points can make all the difference. Yeah, and of course it's all accumulated over time. So you know the, the the deviation from where they thought it was going to be can be incrementally small each month, but it takes you further and further away from being able to actually um you know to get back on track. It's interesting. That I don't know whether you saw there was a tweet. I can't remember who put it up there, but uh, somebody said, "Well, it looks as though rates uh, probably aren't going to get um, cut anytime soon." Um, you know, but. Most of the economists were all calling it wrong. I uh, wonder why that is. You know, are they in, in group think land or, or whatever it is? And in fact, if you look at the markets, you'd have to say that um, expectation of rate hikes, um, well, it's not totally on beyond even Australia now. No, and that's a good, 
nice little segue into the next slide. This is a chart from which AMP put out today, and all of a sudden we've gone from priced pricing in quite a few, more than a few rate cuts by September and December, to all of a sudden we've got half a rate hike priced in for September, half a rate sorry, half a rate rise. We had rate cuts priced in, I should say, half a rate rise priced in for the September meeting with the RBA. Now. I'm of the view that we'll see the labour market weaken, which will sort of put a bit of a kibosh on this. But if somehow that doesn't happen, then it's well and truly on the table if inflation remains resurgent and, you know, we struggle to sort of make the progress in the in the inflationary, in the CPI categories where we need to. Yeah, and the yields, of course, in Australia are also higher than they were, which is a bit of a proxy for where rates might go. One of the reasons why mortgage rates are um, sort of sticky higher than, than than perhaps a lot of people expected. Interestingly, I've had uh, probably five or six people send me um, communications either via uh, social media or email saying, well, we were holding on. We've got uh, a mortgage that is going to um, effectively switch from fixed to variable over the next few months, you know, and people were talking about um, between, um, uh, you know, June and the end of the year or, or next year. So we were banking, they said, on the fact that rates are coming down. So it, well, we weren't we weren't worrying too much. Suddenly, <laughs> we're getting quite worried because if in fact the mortgage rates stick around where they are or even go higher, then that's going to be a huge impost. And of course, there was a recent um, piece of analysis in the. Uh, I think it was the, the RBA bulletin that showed that there's still quite a lot of people on low fixed rates that are still to switch to variable rates. Now, those variable rates potentially could be quite a lot higher than had been factored in earlier on. So this is going to be yet another drag potentially on households. Indeed. And I think that it's something that's interesting is, you know, you and I have been talking about people who have been finding themselves in, in difficulty for a, for a while now. And, you know, we've we've both commented on the fact that you've got various different, you know, support and hardship programs that, you know, you, that we basically didn't have last time we had a, a serious, you know, rate, rate rise and, you know, sort of recessionary-esque conditions. And I think the thing is, how, how many people are using up their rope in those sets of circumstances who are you know, in hardship, who have taken the payment holidays, who've done all these different things in, in order to keep, you know, the wolves away from the door. How much time do those people actually have left? And realistically, if all of the, if the market is correct and if we're not going to see rate, rate cuts until, you know, February or later, or we might even see rate rises, are these people going to be able to take that? And I think that there is arguably some sign that in some cases the answer is no, in the sense that if you compare the, the new listing numbers for properties being listed for sale between Sydney and Melbourne and the other major capitals, they're like chalk and cheese. Melbourne and Sydney are both seeing normal, not much more rapid normalisation of stock, whereas the other capitals are still off in la-la land with low levels of stock. And that's something that that has occurred in New Zealand, which is now, which they saw that that um, immigration-driven rise in property prices, which now they're starting to see, you know, more property hit the market. All of a sudden, those property price rises are petering out in a lot of different places. Yeah, well, the scenarios that I've always been looking at included one where rates stayed higher for longer. As a result of that, more people got into difficulty and the pressure to sell just grew. And, uh, of course, the, the the balance between supply and demand is always the, the tricky part with prices. But uh, in some markets, we're already seeing Melbourne, of course, is leading the way down at the moment. So even the um, indices are showing no price growth on aggregate in Melbourne, although the aggregate doesn't really tell you that much um, compared with some other markets. But um, it'll be interesting to see because, of course, it's Tasmania that's had the uh, most significant falls more recently in, in, in the value of property, whereas Adelaide and Perth and Queensland, um, particularly around Brisbane, have been quite strong. But it could change. And uh, it doesn't take much to sort of mix the um, supply and demand the other way. And 
there's a self-fulfilling feedback loop as well, because, of course, if people think that prices are likely to go backwards rather than not, that might bring forward prospective sales, which has a self-perpetuating negative feedback loop. So it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out. I think the next six months on property prices will be really, really interesting. It's an interesting sort of, you know, just like what you mentioned, just in terms of the psychology and the perception and stuff. I think that's an interesting one in particular for Melbourne. Like if you look back at, say, Perth over like the last, let's call it, you know, 12 years, that paints a very interesting picture of, you know, the the last tail, tail into the boom into you know, the, the 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 falling prices in nominal terms and, you know, the relatively, you know, sizable falls in in, in inflation and in wage wage adjusted uh, metrics. And I, I sort of wonder if that is potentially going to be Melbourne's future. You know, uh, you know, this is, you know, just thinking out loud here, just like, you know, we are still seeing those, you know, less than favourable migration flows compared with the way it was. You know, Melbourne used to be, you know, prior to COVID, was the mecca for, you know, migration in, in per capita terms. And it was quite popular in terms of that internal migration as well, whereas these days, not so much. And I mean, I think the, the thing is, is that m perhaps it's masking things. Perhaps it's because there's more Melburnians heading off up to Queensland or, you know, up to the New South Wales coast or whatever. But... It just doesn't look as favourable as it once as it once did, and there's a reason why. You know, by some metrics, Melbourne property prices are at roughly sort of you know 2017, 2018 levels. Yes, and let me just make this point because if you look at the default rates, guess which state has the highest default rates? Victoria, <laughs> Western Australia are still yes. the hangover, and that's the point. These things take a long, long time to work through, right? So, you know, the latest uh, mortgage-backed security data show that the highest level defaults are still in Western Australia. And I suspect that it can take three to five years for this all to work through because, of course, people, you know, muddle on and um, try and get by. Um, but if prices do begin to, to fall and you start getting negative equity scenarios, that leads you into difficulty later. So um, everybody who's talking about the Perth market being absolutely booming at the moment, just bear in mind that the default rates are higher, so they there too. That's an interesting one because I, it just makes me think just in terms of what exactly is going to happen in terms of the psychology of people who do have these big mortgages who do find themselves unable to pay them and they do see their equity of you know sort of evaporating like you know this isn't the US post GFC you know where rates have been crash dived you could refinance your mortgage to you know just on you know on very nearly untold level of low rates as long as you could qualify for the credit we're in a very unique situation here where we could see rates high for a protracted period and people are potentially in a scenario where they're going to be watching their equity evaporate. Yep. And that, to me, that that's going to be an interesting one if that does end up coming to pass. Because uh, I, I, the, the thing is, so much of this comes down to migration. Like, I, I'm honestly, God's honest truth, I'm sick of talking about it. I'm sick, you know, I'm sick of it conceptually. But... At the end of the day, it is just the key to this, you know, because if Melbourne does get another 150, 170,000 new arrivals from overseas in net terms, then yes, that's obviously going to help support the property market. But if it magically went back down to say, I don't know, let's call it 60, 70, 80,000, different story, very different story. And then, you know, you're talking about a completely different ball game. Yeah, well, I had Leith Van Onselen on the other week uh, on my show. And, uh, you know, again, he's very, very strong on the key to all of the economic woes we have at the moment is the high migration. And, uh, you know, you, we can't build enough property. We aren't building enough infrastructure to support people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so therefore, the migration story is the one that you've got to actually address first. And then he went on to say, and of course, if you address that, and also the energy problem where the high gas prices are actually leading to much higher energy prices than it should, those two levers would actually take us into a very different future 
But of course, those are politically unacceptable things to deal with. So it comes back ultimately not just to economics, but to politics. And um, you know, the, the levers that are there potentially to help alleviate some of the inflationary pressures are those that are politically unacceptable. Yeah, pretty much. Unfortunately, I wish I had something more meaningful to add to that, but that's 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 a pretty good summation. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty good. I'll put the link below to uh, to the show. It was um, it was a live show, and he he was really coming off his long run. Ah, <laughs> oh, he he he, he, get, he gets fired up, but he's well and truly on target. I'm a big yeah. fan. Absolutely. Okay, next slide. <laughs> okay, now I was going through the various demographic data for Australia because. I wanted to look back on what proportion of first home buyers were getting into the market relative to the overall relative to the overall first home buyer, you know, sort of demographic, which is historically the 25 to 34 demographic. At least that's how CoreLogic defined it. So I figured they've done their data. I'm going to do mine. I'm going to go back further. Anyway, what I found was something really, really interesting. The population of Australia between the ages of 25 to 34, between 1991 and about 2006, barely grew. It grew by less than 2% across that entire time. It was remarkably stable. And I think that there is an argument to be made that that is part of why during the late 90s, before we saw the capital gains tax in a discount introduced and the doubling of the first home loaner grant and those other stimulatory policies, why property prices were affordable. But what we've seen now is we've seen an absolute explosion in the number of people aged 25 to 34 and ergo people of home buying age. So it's not really surprising that when you increase the size of a, of a potential first home buyer cohort by 35%, and, th and I will note that this only covers until the end of 2022. This doesn't include the big, huge rise in migration seen in 2023 and 2024. So it just goes to show that when you increase the competition for something so significantly. And not only that, but during that time, we've seen since the very early 2000s, we've seen the housing turnover rate fall from over 9% to about 4.5. So it's halved. So we've increased the number of prospective first home buyers in this cohort by 35%. But at the same time, we've more than halved the amount of stock available on the market for them to buy. And what happens? It's, you know, it's year nine business study stuff, you know? And you look at it and you go, it's, it's, it's obvious, you know? I mean, it's plain as day. I mean, to be honest, I didn't personally see this coming to this degree, but there it is. Yeah, this is a very telling slide. And, uh, you know, just to reiterate, the significant acceleration away and the continued acceleration, and that goes right back to the discussion we had about uh, high migration, of course, uh, bearing in mind that the natural growth of population is much, 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 much lower. So this is where the um, uh, migration story really intersects with uh, the property story. And a lot of those people aged 25 to 34 end up, of course, in the rental sector, which is another reason why we're seeing significant pressure, particularly on the, on the rentals. A lot of these could well be also students because the temporary migration numbers are way, way, way higher than previously. Uh, of course, the um, universities um, want to argue for more student migration to support the uh, economies of the universities, never mind whether it actually supports the economy of the country. Um, but this is a really, really big and important factor, I think, you have put your finger on here. Yeah, it's it's kind of. I was I was a little bit shocked to be completely honest with you. I was just I was not so much shocked that that, that we had seen such a huge ramp up, but just the fact that of growth was just so non-existent for so long prior to that. And you know, I think the thing is, you know, when when young people say, and when not even just young people, when non-homeowners say it's hard to it's harder to get into the market. There's it, there's more competition to get into the market. There's there's less stock relative to the, to the level of demand. 
they're absolutely 100% definitively correct. It is just true beyond the pale, beyond any sort of reasonable level of criticism that it's just concrete data right there. All you've got to do is look at the turnover data and look at the population data and hey presto. Yeah, and I think this also explains why we've seen the proliferation of tent cities because, uh, you know, younger people and perhaps, you know, individuals or, um, you know, small family units are capable of living in tents, but certainly in the short term. And uh, for me, the blight on Australian economy and on Australian society from these tent cities is writ large in the failure of government policy over many, many years. This chart of yours explains why. Yeah, I, I think, you know, like they recently, you know, I think it was like back during, you know, you know, the pandemic, it was like, you you know, it's really helpful if you've got, you know, y- your parents to help you buy a house and stuff like that, you know, like that that was, you know, sort of one of the deciding factors. And that's absolutely true. But I think one of the things that has just gotten disturbing is just how that sort of reliance on parents and, you know, older people for young people has just, you know, accelerated and deteriorated in the sense that it's like, if you can't find a rental, you better hope that you have a damn good relationship with your parents. Because, you know, otherwise it's, you know, it's dodgy, potentially dodgy share house, if that's all you can find, or it's tent city. And that's just an absolutely absurd situation to be in. And this isn't like, you know, and I think the thing is like people on welfare benefits have been in that situation for years. That is not a new thing for people in those circumstances, even for people on, you know, on sort of casual and low, low paying, you know, minimum wage jobs. You know, I mean, it's, it's horrible to say, and, you know, I've, you know, you and I have been, have been talking about this for a long time, but it, it has been the reality. But these days you're talking about people who are on full time, roughly median full time incomes who can't get homes. And it's just it's just ridiculous, and I'm going to stop myself there before this turns into a 15-minute rant. <laughs> Probably wise, because we have covered it before, but it does show you how dramatically severe this issue is and many people are, are actually caught. What about the employment story? Um, because that's also another angle on this, isn't it? It is indeed. Now, it's a mess. The data is a mess. If you were to look at the data in January, you would have thought, wow, we are knocking on the door of a recession because if we are only creating 7,000 jobs a month and we need thirty to 40,000 jobs a month just to tread water, yeah, we've got a problem. In December, we got a problem. March, well, things are looking up. And if you look at the participation rate, all of a sudden... The participation rate is lower, so all those people are no longer present in the labour force as they otherwise would have been, and ergo, unemployment looks better. So it's a bit, it's a bit of a mess to be honest. And you know, I sort of foolishly, you know, put stock in the in the ABS data in you know December and January, thinking, well, this looks pretty dire. But frankly. I still think it looks pretty. I, I still think it looks pretty, pretty ordinary. If you look at all the various other indicators, they're all pointing to weakening, weakening jobs growth outcomes. But the ABS says things, things looking pretty good. So, yes. Well, the um, numbers of uh, available jobs and uh, particularly some categories uh, have come way back from where, from where they were. It looks so. In other words, the supply looks a, a little different from where it was, um, and. Uh, you know, that would suggest that some employers are not hiring so fast. Uh, and in fact, in some, they're actually seem quite easy now to get um, the people that they need. Um, I think there are big issues, big, big issues with the um, ABS data on the uh, employment. But it is interesting to see that, that similar problems exist in the US, exist in the UK and other places too. And it's partly because the ability to get good sampling data seems to be a problem. Maybe it's because they're the methodology that's used, but also there's significant revisions 
and some of the US data, of course, the revisions have been quite remarkable, right? Seeing the um, you know the employment numbers. So bearing in mind this is such a critical element within within the overall story of how you measure an economy and therefore how you measure the impact of inflation and those things. The fact that the employment data is sus is a really big issue because you haven't got a compass. No, I mean, like I, I, I've spoken to a few economists about this, you know, sort of, you know, off the record. And the general consensus is that unemployment is about 4, 4.1, 4.2%, somewhere in that range. And, you know, we're talking 3.8, 3.9 with the ABS. Now, while that may not sound like a big difference, when Bullock's line of the, in the sand is about 4.5, that makes a fairly significant difference. So it's really quite a bit of a mess. And I think in some ways, if this does end up, if we do end up you know, having this conversation in 12 months and it's revised and it turns out everything was much worse than it appeared, I think people are going to have every right to be pissed off with the ABS because- you know, things would, you know, things justified a very, very different policy response, you know, to the one that we're getting. Yes. Well, uh, I think the ABS is partly responsible. I think the RBA is partly responsible because of their policy mistakes in the past. And uh, I don't think they've uh, stopped making policy mistakes. Um, so those two institutions, mm -hmm. you know, are basically sitting there uh, steering a lot of the decisions, but uh, if the basis of the decisions are actually a bit suspect, then um, you know we could be actually making policy errors. The trouble is with policy errors, you don't know on day one that it was an error. You've got to wait to see how it plays out, which means, of course, that uh, water has to go under the bridge. It means that perhaps uh, unemployment will rise, which means that more people will have difficulty. And only later, well, then they say, oh, actually, <clears throat> well, maybe we didn't quite get it right. But of course, then they don't tend to want to admit admit that they actually got it wrong. So that's the other part of it, isn't it? There's little accountability here. I think the thing as well is that like if the choices do come down to in you know in in the end in hindsight to either recession or not or, or either recession now or either recession later. I think this is going to go down as a fairly sizable mistake by the Albanese government. Not just a sizable mistake, a huge mistake. Mm. You know, choosing to instead grow the labor force by an additional, let's call it 300,000 people a year you know, per year over multiple years, you know, expanding the labour force to that degree and then ending up eating a recession anyway and you end up, you know, having the unemployment line being, you know, even potentially larger as the economy sort of shrinks and reverts to a more, uh, you know, a more sort of streamlined and efficient, you know, because, I mean, that's what happens in recessions. You know, deadwood gets cut and you end up with a, you know, leaner, meaner economy. But the problem with that is that you end up with the same lean amino economy in relative terms, and it's not that much larger to be able to justify the expansion of the labor force to that degree. So you end up with more people unemployed, more, more migrants potentially having to go home because they can't find enough gainful employment and work. And I think that's part of the problem with all of this is that, you know, it's all predicated on this idea that, oh, it's great for migrants. I don't see how it's great for migrants to be welcomed into this absolute fuster clock of a rental environment and that that's all, all something that we should all get behind, you know, and sing Kubaya. No, well, I agree with that. And interestingly, of course, in New Zealand, because New Zealand was also running very strong migration, they've actually started to make decisions to try and dial back the migration part of the story, even as, as you said a little while ago, the property listings <laughs> story there has changed quite interestingly. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting one. We should probably get through these last few slides if we can. Speaking of New Zealand, you're getting good at these segues, Martin. Me, not so much. <laughs> what we've got here is total homes for sale, which are currently around about 2016 levels. And if we look at the prices in some areas, they've started to drop off, in particular in Auckland. They, they peaked about five months ago and they've now sort of trended sideways to maybe down slightly. Now, at first I thought that was seasonality, but the sort of duration of the move has sort of made me reconsider that that particular viewpoint. Now, I think it's worth noting that it is different in some locales. Some are still performing quite well. It's very much similar to the situation with Sydney and Melbourne versus the other larger capitals and the regional areas. You know, they can also be quite desperate in terms of outcomes. But yeah, it's it's interesting. And 
the question is, is will prices fall further as the Kiwi economy continues to sort of hobble along in, you know, sort of quasi-recession mode? Well, and of course, bear in mind that the cash rate in the US, in the US is higher, about 5%. Same as in New Zealand, right? Our cash rate is significantly out of kilter with most other Western economies. And you can see there that the higher interest rate in New Zealand has created some of the issues that we've been talking about. The sort of recessionary forces in New Zealand are stronger. And uh, now we're seeing it coming into the property market. So the really interesting question is if Australia does put those rates a little higher to try and tackle the sticky inflation that we're now seeing, will that then flow through to the same extent as we see in New Zealand now, where the listings rise and therefore property prices begin to uh, to ease back. I mean, you know, this is another of those precarious, uh, twitchy situations. But our cash rate is significantly below others. Now, of course, there are people saying, well, that's because we've got a higher proportion of variable rate mortgages, so the impact is um, more significant. That's true. Even New Zealand has a higher fix than, than variable. But nevertheless, it seems to me that Australia is out of kilter in terms of cash rates. I think one of the interesting things in all this, and like we were talking about earlier, that you know migration is the key. But the the question is, what happens to the property market if the worm really turns? If people, if the, the labor market turns, we start to see rising unemployment. We start to see people heading, you know, you know, temporary migrants and stuff starting to head home. And all of a sudden, we do start to see some degree of normalization, at least in some locales in terms of rental availability. Now, a broader national salvation for the rental crisis, that's going to take, you know, outside of, you know, a major recession and exodus is going to take years. But in some locales, in particularly places like Sydney and Melbourne that are already on that sort of tipping point, the question is what could happen in that regard? And I think that that is, you know, like it's just something that, is really key to all of this, just in the sense that if we didn't have this level of migration, there is not not one call it zero chance, but a very low chance that we would see the property market that we do, that we do today. I think it would be much much more like the way it was prior to you know the the impact being felt. Sort of like let's call it late twenty twenty two, early twenty twenty three. You know, a downward march, but not at an especially fast rate, and. The question is, what happens when things eventually do return to normal? You know, we've seen the market artificially first propped up by low interest rates. They're gone. And what happens when, you know, the high migration driving things ends up, you know, being resolved in time as well? You know, I mean, what happens to, ca you know, property price capital growth? You know, as all of a sudden, you know, you, you start to see, you know, the, the tables turn and, you know, the, the balance tip in the other direction. Yes. Well, if the wealth effect goes into reverse, and of course, over the last little while, a lot of people have actually felt more wealthy because property prices have risen. One of the reasons why the bank and mum and dad still exist is because uh, people had equity in their properties that they could, uh, could share. If it starts to go into reverse, um, two things happen. One is the cash purchases from bank and mum and dad disappear. Secondly, the downward draft starts to capitulate and multiply and it can start dropping quite significantly we saw that in some other countries post 2007 now i'm not saying it's necessarily going to happen but again in my scenarios one of the scenarios i do run is just this one where you actually tie back migration rates stay high for longer or go a little higher and property prices do fall and unfortunately in some areas they could fall quite significantly, which then destroys wealth, which creates its own problems. So I think we are in a very precarious uh, situation, you know, just, just at the moment. And coming right back to where we started, you know, with this sort of risk of stagflation, with the risk potentially of uh, of interest rates higher, um, it's all to play for, isn't it, over the next little while? So there was plenty to talk about when we uh, have our next show. Oh, definitely. There's... <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I think the thing is, you know, I, you see these these data releases and you go, huh, I'm definitely going to have to talk to Martin about that. And I think what ends up happening sometimes is there's, there's, there ends up being about six, seven or eight different things. And it's just we, we can't even get through them all in a day. <laughs>
<laughs> no, we'd have to have a 24 by 7 show if we were going to cover everything that's going on at the moment. But we we give a good fist of it, you know, once every couple of weeks. And I want to appreciate, uh, once again, all the work you put into the charts and everything and the conversation. And um, we'll do it again in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, sounds good, man. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Take care. See ya. See you, mate.